Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back. This is Dr. L with a, uh, another segment here. And in this segment, we are going to take our first look at uh, a concept known as externalities. And uh, believe it or not, this is something that we've already discussed in this course. Um, an externality is basically a situation where an action taken by one person uh, has some sort of uh, net cost or benefit that spills over onto somebody else. Um, so all of our analysis of game theory leading up to this point uh, is very closely related to our discussion of uh, externalities in that particular uh, regard here. So I am gonna relate uh, some of the games that we talked about uh, earlier on to uh, very specific externality situations and frame them as externality type problems. So. The agenda for this particular part of the talk is as follows. Uh, we're going to take a look at a few examples of different types of externalities, and then we're going to take a look at the competitive market framework and think about modeling two specific cases. We're going to model a specific case of negative externalities on the production side. Uh, we'll take a look at how does the presence of a negative externality affect the market equilibrium outcome versus the efficient outcome. Uh, we're actually gonna see an interesting result and the breakdown of the invisible hand in this particular framework. And we'll think about uh, different types of corrective policies that we could possibly implement to try to restore uh, the efficient outcome in cases where private market outcomes might differ. Uh, then we'll go ahead and take a look at the same idea in the presence of a positive externality on the consumption side. And uh, we will characterize a very particular type of corrective solution to both of these problems known as the Pigouvian solution, uh, which essentially utilizes government intervention as a way to force private individuals to internalize the side effects that they cause society through their actions when their actions cause externalities. So before we jump into this discussion of externalities and thinking about modeling them in the perfectly competitive market framework, uh, it's a good idea to revisit our discussion of supply and demand curves. Um, recall that uh, when we introduced demand curves in this course, uh, we saw that there were really multiple definitions of how you could think about a demand curve. And one of those definitions involve the demand curve measuring the dollar value marginal benefit to an individual uh, that was consuming a good in the competitive market framework. So that is what the demand curve was. It was essentially some type of marginal benefit schedule. And we didn't really differentiate between the individual's marginal benefit versus society's marginal benefit. We assumed if it's a dollar benefit for the individual, well, that individual is part of society, so that gain is also a dollar benefit to society. And we didn't really allow for this idea that when an individual takes an action, the individual's benefit may differ from society's. And uh, I think if you think about things like drug use, heroin use, I think is a good example, where maybe an addict feels like by taking heroin, there's some benefit to themselves. But from a societal perspective, probably most folks would agree that that doesn't benefit society as a whole, and there are a lot of negative implications that can arise from that type of behavior. Um, so this assumption that the demand curve captured both private and societal values uh, equally may not be a reasonable assumption in the presence of different types of externalities. And what that is going to mean for us uh, is that the way society measures the economic pie might be different from the way an individual might measure the economic pie from their perspective. Um, similarly, uh, with supply curves, we assume they reflected the marginal cost of production to individuals in the competitive market framework. Um, and again, that those costs of production were reflective also of society's cost. Okay, and so the supply curve, again, captured both private and marginal costs. Oh, sorry, both private marginal costs and societal marginal costs. Those were the same thing. And similarly, similarly, on the demand side, the demand curve captured both private marginal benefits and societal marginal benefits. So I want to be clear. This is the framework that we've really been in, in the perfectly competitive market model, in that we did not distinguish between differences in private values versus societal values. 
America. And so in that private market framework where we did not have any of these externalities at play, essentially every market agent lived in their own little bubble. And within your own little bubble, you could take whatever actions you wanted to make yourself well off and the consequences of your actions stayed within that little bubble. Okay? And that led us to an interesting outcome. It led us to an outcome in private markets, right? Looking at the competitive market framework, whereby a hands-off approach led to the market maximizing the size of the total surplus pie. It was an efficient equilibrium outcome when we allowed all those market agents to behave selfishly. So in that framework, what was good for the individual who lived in their little bubble turned out to be also what was good for society. Now, problem being is the reality is we don't live in those bubbles. Actions that I take and spill over into your, your life, your bubble and affect you and vice versa. So we're connected. And in this framework, selfish individuals taking actions for themselves can lead to damages to other individuals that cause the pie to shrink when everybody behaves selfishly. So the main idea that I want to convey here is that uh, really externalities are situations where you have some sort of a side effect as a consequence of private actions. Okay, these can be on the demand side for consumption. These can be on the supply side from production. And again, we're thinking about a situation here where individual A takes an action and this results in some net cost or some net benefit to a different individual, individual B. And there is some, uh, again, I'm going to use this term a few times here probably today. There is some side effect of the action. And that side effect is not felt by the individual taking the action. The individual taking the action does not bear the consequences in full of the action, meaning some consequence is shifted away from that individual to somebody else. Okay, and that consequence could be a good thing or a bad thing. And it should make sense that when some of your consequence is shifted away from you, that might change your behavior. Okay, point being, when this happens, we observe a divergence from private values, or rather in be uh, divergence between private values and societal values. Okay, so that either... Uh, you know, we might have societal costs that are not reflective of private costs. We might have societal benefits that are not reflective of private benefits. Or we could wind up in a situation where we maybe have a market that's really distorted and we have both of these things going on. Okay, now we are going to focus uh, really on two specific situations today. Uh, those are situations where we have bad side effects. Uh, which we're going to refer to here as specifically the case of negative externalities. And these are situations where an individual takes an action and because of the negative side effect, society feels a larger cost than the individual does. And remembering that the individual is part of that society as well. Okay. Now, positive externalities, on the other hand, are situations where individual actions lead to good side effects. And, and in these situations, we don't have a divergence of costs. We're gonna think about a divergence of benefits. Society will receive a larger benefit for that action relative to the private individual benefit, since there's part of that benefit the individual does not capture. All right, now let's go ahead and start off our discussion here, uh, specifically looking at examples of negative externalities. So again, uh, negative externalities, these are situations where an individual takes an action, and I'm gonna refer to that as a private action, and the costs of that action spill over to society in a way where they are not fully borne by the individual who takes the action. All right, so examples that we're thinking about here is a pretty classic one, uh, is that a firm produces some steel, but also generates pollution as a byproduct of the production process. The firm faces the production costs associated with raw materials, right, steel, labor, et cetera. Okay, those are private costs that are visible to the firm, but the costs of pollution, those are borne by the residents of the nearby towns that inhale the particulate matter, and have adversely affected health outcomes. Those are the external 
damages. So the firm, what's visible to them, well, the cost of raw materials, labor, et cetera. But the firm does not see the cost of pollution. That is borne by the uh, residents of the nearby towns. So those are the external damages. Uh, here's another pretty classic example. An individual smokes a cigarette themselves, and that causes damage from smoke inhalation directly, right? But there is also some discomfort of other folks in close proximity, right? The proverbial secondhand smoke, which is, it's a real thing, uh, but that's an external damage. Um, you know, and again, related to the pollution example here, I think. Uh, another example that you might think about, um, and this is a little bit more abstract, but when an individual speeds to work to get there on time, that increases the likelihood of a crash, right? That's a private cost to you. You speed to work, you might weigh your private cost of crashing against the benefit of you arriving at work on time. But the problem is you also increase the likelihood of somebody else getting in an accident with you. And you probably don't fully account for the cost to somebody else when you weigh that cost benefit trade off of speeding to work. Okay. Uh, another example, an individual takes a plea bargain to get a better deal for themselves by admitting guilt, right? So you admit, admit guilt, there's some private cost there. Yeah, but in doing so, you might provide evidence that results in a worse deal for your partner in crime. So I get the plea bargain, but they get a worse sentence. So I you know, took some action, there's a cost to me, but part of that cost gets shifted to the other party, my partner in crime. Okay, kind of related to that uh, Jack and Jill game theory situation we may have talked about earlier uh, with the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, so all these examples, they, they have a few elements in common, really one main thing here, and that is the total societal cost to multiple agents of a private action by one of those agents exceeds the private cost to the individual taking that action. Okay? That is, the societal marginal cost of the action exceeds the private marginal cost of the action. And if we were to look at, well, what explains the difference between society's cost and the individual's cost? Well, the difference between them has to be explained by the marginal external damages that are spilling over. So let's go ahead and uh, give this problem a little bit of graphical context now that we've thought about some uh, applicable real life situations. And we're gonna start off here by thinking about a negative externality in production. Um, so, uh, let's talk about the situation. So this is related to the pollution or the cigarette smoking, all those situations we just discussed in the previous slide, where the cost of taking an action from an individual's perspective doesn't fully account for the full damage that action takes on society. Okay? Where again, the individual is part of that society. Okay? That is, the social marginal cost is going to be greater than the private marginal cost. So we're going to think about this as us having really two different supply curves in our model. We're gonna have a supply curve for the individual, but then we're gonna have a supply curve that captures society's cost. And for now, we're not gonna worry about any uh, positive externality distortions on the demand side. So for now, let's assume that the demand curve reflects both social and private costs. There is no spillover. Okay. Uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to take a look at the private market equilibrium and compare that to the socially efficient outcome. Okay? And it's probably not too surprising that when we use the private marginal cost curve and look where that intersects the private marginal benefit curve, that is literally us looking at the supply curve and where it intersects the demand curve in the traditional private market framework we were in. Okay, however, when we want to think about the socially efficient outcome, what's the outcome that maximizes the pie for society? Well, we also know already that occurs where, from society's perspective, marginal benefit equals marginal cost. And that is no longer going to be the same outcome as the efficient outcome that maximizes total surplus because we have a divergence between society's marginal cost and the private marginal cost. 
So let's go ahead and take a look at what the uh, private market equilibrium would look like here if we did not regulate anybody. All we do is we have the government protecting property rights. And in this case, right, the individual does not care about, uh, you know, the marginal external damages it causes to society. It only really cares about the private marginal cost to themselves. Right, so that's really the visible cost from the individual perspective here. So we can think about just getting rid of that social marginal cost curve and asking from this perspective, you know, what is the private market equilibrium? And I think that's fairly straightforward here. The red curve is the demand curve, right? It is uh, the private marginal benefit of consumption. We're going to look at the allocation where it intersects the private marginal cost of production, right? So from this perspective, the individuals will take enough action to optimize the total private net benefit for themselves. This is like the total surplus from the private individual's perspective. Okay, how do they do that? Well, they compare the private benefit against the private cost of every unit that they are going to generate and trade, right? They look and see, oh, this first unit here, the private cost was uh, extremely low. Right. Private cost was down here, but the benefit was way up here. So of course, the private individuals are gonna wanna trade that unit and generate surplus. Um, and we can make that argument, right? Second unit, more surplus is generated, third unit, fourth unit, fifth unit, so on and so forth. Um, um, so what we're looking at here is uh, something that's kind of a strange thing to think about, but this is the total surplus from the private individual's perspective, not accounting at all for any external damages that they do. Okay. And if, um, again, we move to the right of where those curves intersect, where the private marginal benefit falls short of that marginal cost, then uh, normally that tells us, well, we must have done too much. We produced too much. We took too much of that action and we need to cut back. Meaning if we leave the private markets to their quote unquote own devices here, we allow them to operate freely. We don't restrict them in any way other than protecting property rights. Then the optimizing agents in that market will push that market to the competitive outcome where supply equals demand through all those normal pressures that we had discussed uh, way earlier on in the course. So this is the unregulated private market equilibrium. And that's what happens when the free market does its thing. Okay, now why is that bad? Well, I'm gonna argue it's bad from an efficiency perspective because from society's perspective, the actual marginal cost is a little bit higher. And accounting for that actual marginal cost from society's perspective, it looks like the individual in the last example was producing too much quantity. And there was too much trade happening, too much effort going on for whatever this activity was. Now, from society's perspective, the full cost of the individual's actions include not only the individual's private cost, but if we add to that uh, the marginal external damages that are generated, Okay, we can see the distance between those curves, right? That accounts for the size of the externality. And I drew these curves in a way where it looks like the externality is doing more marginal damages as we move from left to right. That could be the case, that could not be. You might have those two blue lines parallel to each other if the marginal damage is constant for every additional ton of steel that is produced. Um, or you can have them, you know, maybe move together so that the marginal damages decrease as you produce more. That really depends on the type of narrative you're dealing with here. But for now, not a super important feature of the model. The important feature here is that we have a divergence between societal marginal cost and private marginal cost, um, and that the societal cost exceeds the private cost. That is really the key here. And the societal cost uh, exceeds the private cost to the individual. Okay, so from the perspective of society, if society was measuring, you know, the total net benefit in terms of total surplus from trading, okay, then the society is going to be measuring the total surplus differently than the individual does. 
And this is a complication that we didn't really have to deal with in the competitive framework up until this point, because we didn't differentiate between whose values was the demand curve capturing, individuals values or societal's values. We said, well, they're the same thing. There's no spillover effects. Okay, but if there are spillover effects, right, then from society's perspective, the cost is actually much higher than it was from the private individual's perspective. So from society's perspective, we're going to ignore the PMC and do the actual cost accounting here, right? If society's benefit exceeds society's cost, then we will go ahead and trade that unit. Okay, right. So again, uh, if we look at the cost of society, it's down here. It's below the benefit, which is up here. Um, so because of that, we trade that unit. And again, we can generate societal surplus trading a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Um, and if we go too far to the right, then you'll notice society's benefit falls below the cost. And then we would start losing surplus. So we don't want to go too far to the right of that cross. Otherwise, we start generating bad trades. These are surplus reducing trades. Okay. Um, so the sweet spot, where does society want to stop in terms of society's perspective on that total surplus? They want to stop at the efficient allocation, which is Q star displayed here. That is the efficient outcome from a societal perspective. And really the societal perspective is the right perspective on the economic pie. The economic pie is the net benefits to society, not to individuals. And so if you're wondering which perspective is the right perspective here, in terms of total surplus, it is the societal perspective. Now, here is the full picture. We have these two different allocations. What will private markets do? Well, if we let the markets alone, private markets will produce that much. Um, how much should be allocated to maximize the size of the pie? Well, we just saw the efficient quantity is here. So what happens when the market produces QPC if it's left unregulated? Well, first off, this is the first time in the course, I think, really, where Q star was not referencing the, the uh, competitive level of output. It's still the efficient level of output, but it is not the equilibrium level of output anymore. And so the market is not just going to get pushed to Q star here. The market is going to get pushed towards QPC. Okay, competitive markets left on their own will allocate a volume of trade, again, where private supply curves and private demand curves intersect. Where the private marginal cost offsets the private marginal benefit, and that is here. That is the free market outcome. And I'm going to argue the source of deadweight loss in this situation relative to society supply curves and society's demand curves looks like the dead weight loss we get when we trade too much relative to Q star, okay, right? So if we were to keep trading up to Q star from society's perspective, those are all the good trades. But if we go past Q star towards the competitive level, then we start making these trades where society's cost exceeds society's benefit. Right? And that means in the private market equilibrium, we are generating some dead weight loss. Okay, that is the deadweight loss in the private market equilibrium relative to society's perspective on the surplus buy here. So in this example, it is critically important that you see here this result, the result being that the private market equilibrium no longer maximizes total surplus in the presence of this type of externality. Okay, if you have a negative externality, free market policies will not work in the sense that they do in the undistorted competitive market framework. Okay, the invisible hand will fail. The free market outcome, the competitive outcome, QPC, is not the outcome that maximizes the pie from society's perspective, which is Q star. So question then becomes, well, you know, how can we improve this uh, market outcome from a policy perspective given that we're in a situation where market failure is preventing that invisible hand mechanism from working, is preventing 
the selfish actions of private individuals from aggregating and adding up into an outcome that is also good for the society of those individuals. And we've seen this idea before that what's good for the individual is not what's good for the society of individuals, right? Uh, for example, in the prisoner's dilemma game, what was good for the individuals, well, individually ratting was the best thing for the players to do. But that led to them and to an equilibrium outcome that was not efficient. They would each be individually better off if they both switched and did not rat in that prisoner's dilemma framework. So this idea that private actions can lead to an equilibrium outcome that is different than what is efficient, we've seen that before in our study of uh, games and strategy. Okay? And we're seeing it again here specifically in the competitive market framework, uh, abstracting away from thinking about any game theoretic considerations. So how do we restore the efficient allocation? How can we uh, back this up and restore Q star so that society's pie is maximized in its full glory. And the answer is, well, in order to think about that, we really have to understand the fundamental nature of the problem here. And I would argue there's really two perspectives on how to fix this issue. One is a command and control type of perspective. Oh, if people are doing too much of something, let's just force them to not do as much. Okay put some legal restrictions on the quantity traded here. Uh, and we're also gonna take a look at some price-based type of restrictions, specifically a tax we're gonna take a look at. Uh, you might think price ceiling might do the trick as well. We could think about that, but we're gonna really focus on taxation today. And uh, if a regulation forced private individuals to choose a level of trade at Q star, like let's say by making it illegal, for example, uh, to choose any volume of trade above Q star. Okay, then in principle, this policy would reduce the deadweight loss by forcing trade to a maximum level of Q star. Okay. Uh, so if we do that, if we put a restriction, you cannot consume or produce more than Q star, that will, in theory, alleviate the market of this deadweight loss and restore output back to Q star. Now, the problem is, you know, regulators aren't always in the best position to understand intimately the nature of really two things. The marginal damages associated with an externality can be extremely abstract to measure. Okay, if you take a course on environmental economics, they'll do a lot of discussion about how in practice economists go about estimating these abstract costs and the methodologies can be very flimsy at times okay however the other thing that is also difficult for regulators to understand are the private costs faced by individuals and faced by firms um, so because of that computing what the correct restriction is like what is the level of q star this is something that's generally very difficult for regulators to do and if regulators are heavy handed, if they restrict too much, it is possible, for example, if they restrict output to let's say this level here, okay, then what winds up happening uh, is they potentially cause even more damage than they were trying to fix by introducing another source of deadweight loss where this uh, really dark red triangle here represents uh, trades that would be mutually beneficial from society's perspective, but will be blocked under a quantity restriction that was too harsh. Okay. So what does this type of restriction look like? Well, you could say, hey, don't produce more than this many tons of sulfur dioxide emissions in a given period. That places a specific restriction on a quantity uh, of pollutant, which corresponds to a very particular restriction on the quantity of steel you can probably produce unless you're using extra technologies to abate that pollution or clean it up as it is leaving your factory. Um, so command and control restrictions like quantity-based restrictions, they're not super effective in that uh, policymakers are not really in the best position to do things like get great estimates regarding uh, the cost of technology, private marginal costs used by these firms. Uh, moreover, marginal external damages are extremely abstract, right? Think about K 
calculating the external damages from producing another ton of steel and that pollution floats over a neighborhood and it causes people to have asymmetrically poor health outcomes later on in life. That's a very difficult thing to measure. Okay? It affects everybody differently, probably households closer to the pollution are more adversely affected than households farther away. So that's a very, very difficult job to try to quantify in dollars the marginal damages that something does. Now, if we want to restore that efficient allocation, another way we can think about doing this is really by tackling the fundamental problem. And I would argue the fundamental problem here is that some of the individual's cost is borne by others. Okay, that is really the fundamental problem with the negative externality. Some of the individual's cost is borne by others. That means the individual takes too much of that action relative to what is efficient because someone else is stomaching the cost of his burden for them. If somebody takes the cost away of your action, you're going to take more of that action if you're a rational decision maker because you do the cost benefit analysis, your cost looks lower, your benefit looks relatively higher, and you will take that action. Now, there is a solution to this problem known as the Pigouvian solution to the externality problem. And this involves utilizing the government tax mechanism to force the individual to internalize the external damages that they would otherwise generate. So the Pigouvian solution okay, uses taxes via market intervention from the government, right? this is a type of regulation, to get the individual to internalize the damages that they would be generating, right? And otherwise not be taxed on and not have to pay. And in theory, I think the idea seems great. Oh, the problem with the market is some people take actions and they don't pay the full consequence. Well, let's calculate what the consequence is that spills over and let's build that into a tax and force that tax on these people. Okay, that is essentially the idea behind a Pigouvian tax. Okay? In the case of a negative externality, the solution involves taxing the bad behavior at the margin to disincentivize that bad behavior, right? What was the problem? Well, the problem was individuals were doing too much bad behavior. They were taking too much action relative to what was socially optimal. Okay, what we want to do is we want to deter that and we're going to use a tax to deter that action to reduce the volume of uh, Q okay, towards that efficient level. So let's talk about the optimal Pigouvian tax here. Okay, what we essentially want to do is make it so that when the individual has to do the cost benefit analysis, we want the individual to make the same choice that society would make. So to do this, let's go ahead and consider the amount of marginal damages the individual causes at the output level Q star. So if I look at Q star and I look at the difference between the social marginal cost and the private marginal cost, that vertical distance there, that must account for the marginal external damages okay, at the efficient level of trade. And if we tax the individual exactly that amount, any unit that they produce and trade. I'm gonna argue that what that does is it shifts that private marginal cost curve upwards, okay, exactly through this yellow point that I will draw on the diagram right here. Okay, we're gonna shift the PMC curve straight up, parallel, until it goes through that point. Once it goes through that point, I'm gonna argue that uh, asking the individual what quantity do they want to allocate and asking society what quantity it will want to allocate will no longer result in two different answers. Um, so let's go ahead and think about forcing the individual to pay that size tax. And what happens to the marginal cost curve when you tax a seller on their production? Well, what happens it shifts that marginal cost curve up by exactly the size of the tax. So that after tax PMC is parallel to the original PMC and it goes through 
the allocation that is the efficient allocation in terms of price and quantity here. So from the individual's perspective, once we force them to have the tax, the only thing they will really observe is the after-tax private marginal cost. Okay, so I can take away here the actual private marginal cost curve. That is not relevant to the individual anymore. And I would argue now, if you ask the individual, you know, how much do you want to trade and produce, the individual and society would agree that Q star is the right answer to that question. Um, now you might say, hey, why not tax them so that the after-tax private marginal cost lies exactly right on top of the societal marginal cost? Well, we could do that. But I would argue that doing that, if you just jump back here for a little bit, is going to require us to actually change the size of the tax at every possible output level, right? As we produce more and more, the marginal damages get bigger and bigger. So this would actually require a variable tax schedule that says, hey, if you produce this much, this is your tax per unit. But if you produce that much, that's gonna be your tax per unit. And that requires a much more complicated tax schedule if we wanted to shift the PMC curve upwards and tilt it so that the after-tax PMC lied directly on the SMC instead of just shifting it up parallel. Um, so I'm arguing that we can do this with a pretty simple tax mechanism. I don't need that full schedule. All I need is to be able to calculate the size of the tax, which corresponds to the marginal damages at the efficient level of output. Um, and the Pugubian tax, if we charge that, will result in the individuals in the private market outcome choosing the actual efficient level. So let's go ahead and take a look at a numerical example of this. We have a negative externality. We'll go through the model. We'll calculate the equilibrium output. We'll calculate the efficient output by finding the social marginal cost curve. And then we'll figure out what is the corrective tax to implement with the Pagovian solution. Here. So for this numerical example, let's suppose the private marginal cost of firms or of individuals is given by one quarter Q. And suppose the firms generate a negative externality in production so that marginal external damages are given by three quarters Q. And for now, let's suppose that there is uh, no divergence between positive benefits. Okay, I should say no divergence here. Uh, not divergence, but should say the word no right there. No divergence between uh, private benefits and societal benefits so that the uh, demand curve reflects both the societal marginal benefit and the private marginal benefit on the buyer side. Okay, what we first wanna do here is calculate the competitive market equilibrium and we do that by setting the private marginal cost equal to the private marginal benefit. So we're gonna take the private marginal cost here, set it equal to the private marginal benefit one fourth Q equals 100 minus Q. And if we add the Q to the left, that gives us five fourths Q on the left. You solve for Q and you should wind up with uh, finding that the competitive quantity here is going to be 80 units. Okay, now, if we wanted to find the efficient level, then what we would need to do is we would need to combine the private external damages, sorry, the marginal external damages with the private marginal cost. If I add those two things together, that gives me society's full cost of producing at the margin any particular unit. So if we wanted to compute that cost, all we have to do is add up the private marginal cost and those marginal external damages. And we see the societal marginal cost function in this case is equal to Q. Um, and what I would like us to be able to do next is to compute the socially efficient outcome. So let me go ahead and move that societal marginal cost calculation up top. 
And let's go ahead and think about now uh, computing the efficient outcome that maximizes total surplus for society by, in this case, taking the social marginal cost that we just calculated and setting that equal to the societal marginal benefit. So we're going to take Q, set that equal to 100 minus Q. And this tells us that the efficient allocation is actually 50 units. And I think that should make sense given our uh, intuition and in our discussion before that the efficient allocation is actually much lower than the competitive market allocation. Okay. So there's an extra 30 units being traded in the private market that are causing deadweight loss. And if we wanted to quantify the size of the deadweight loss in this example, we could do that. Okay, we would just need to calculate the area of this triangular region in between society supply curve and society's demand curve that captures that usual deadweight loss from overproduction relative to Q star. Okay, now, what about the corrective tax? Well, we could think about implementing that here. If we wanted to implement that corrective tax, we gotta remember that the whole point of the tax is to get the individual to internalize the damage that they are causing. And we're gonna do this by computing again, the marginal damages at the efficient level Q star. And we're gonna go ahead and set the Pigouvian tax according to that value. And so what is Q star? Well, it was 50 in this example. So we're gonna take three quarters, that was the marginal damage function over here, three quarters of 50 units. And that tells us that the corrective Pigouvian tax would be to charge these individuals that are producing whatever good this is that's causing the negative externality, we would charge them $37.50 per unit produced, okay, per ton of steel produced, all right? Now, in theory, this is a great idea, right? Problem is being caused by me not internalizing the full consequences of my actions. The government comes in, says, nope, we're going to force this tax on you, that makes you pay for the consequences of your own action. And again, if the government does this properly, okay, then what they're doing is they're calculating the size of these marginal damages, these abstract costs. They implement that tax mechanism, which shifts up my private marginal cost, and that reduces my incentive to engage in that bad behavior so that the volume of trade that I would choose as a private individual will correspond to the volume of trade that is efficient from society's perspective. Very important idea. So uh, back to our summary page on externalities here. We are now at this point uh, in pretty good shape with negative externalities. Let's go ahead and shift gears a little bit and talk about some positive externalities, which are situations where we have, again, good side effects. And we're gonna think about a positive externality on the uh, consumption side momentarily here, but these are situations where I'm gonna argue that the private benefit to society exceeds the private cost. Uh, and there are lots of classic examples of positive externalities, but again, these are situations where an individual takes an action, a private action, and the benefits of that action now spill over to society in a way where they are not fully borne by the individual taking the action. And one classic example that I think should definitely hit very home for everybody right now is that when an individual gets vaccinated for a highly transmissible disease, those individuals weigh the benefits of not getting sick themselves, which is their private benefit, right against any per personal health risks and monetary cost of vaccination. But the problem is the full benefit of being vaccinated also includes reducing the risk of transmission to others. Um, uh, and that's an external benefit that does not factor into the individual's calculation. All right, now here's another example, an individual uh, that, oh, that mows his or her lawn. Okay. Uh, in order to make their own yard look nice, Right, there is some, again, private benefit from that, right? My yard looks nicer, there's some private benefit. But also, my neighbor's homes look a little bit nicer because they're not living next to some, you know, 
crap hole apartment that is poorly kept. Okay, so I do my landscaping, I benefit, but also my neighbors get some external benefit from that as well. Um, here's kind of another weird situation to think about. Uh, a beekeeper that makes honey for themselves, right? They get a private benefit. Also causes the neighboring flowers to be pollinated. By me having my beekeeping operation, all my neighbor's plants get pollinated. And this increases not only the beauty of the wildlife around, but it increases the yield on anybody's crops, and anybody's fruit trees in the area. And that is an external benefit that the beekeeper does not get to accrue. Uh, here's another uh, more abstract example. An individual earning an education becomes a better decision maker themselves, right? There's a private benefit there. And because they're making better judgments, in some regard, that's better for a societal perspective as well. Now, all of these examples here have, again, a very important common element, and that is the total societal benefit to multiple agents from a private action by one of those agents exceeds the private benefit to the agent taking that action, who is also part of that society. So now we're in a situation where there's not a divergence of costs from society's perspective relative to the individual's perspective. We now have a divergence of benefits. Society's benefit at the margin is gonna exceed the benefit of the private individual. And the difference between those are the marginal external benefits that go unaccounted for. That is the size really of the externality here. So here is a picture of a positive externality in consumption. That is what we're gonna consider. And in this situation, right, we're arguing that there's, instead of having two supply curves, which reflects society's cost and the individual's cost, now we're gonna have two different demand curves. We're gonna have the demand curve for the private individual that reflects private values. And we're gonna have a demand curve for society that reflects the increase in those values relative to the individual's private values. And again, the relationship between those curves, they could be parallel, they could be, you know, getting uh, further apart as you move to the right. It doesn't matter too much at this point, uh, given the nature of the points that we are trying uh, to convey and understand in this framework. So uh, now we're dealing with a positive externality on the consumption side, which is why we have two demand curves. And to simplify the analysis, let's suppose there is no negative externality anymore. So we only have one supply curve that reflects both societies and the private individual's costs at the margin. And what we should be able to do now is think pretty quickly about how to characterize the competitive output level where the private benefit equals the private cost, right? Where is that gonna happen? Well, that's gonna happen right here. Use a different color. Okay, private benefit equals private cost, boom, right there. Okay, that is going to be the competitive market outcome. And similarly, we can find the socially efficient outcome by setting the social marginal benefit equal to the social marginal cost. Uh, and that occurs at a slightly higher level this time. So note that in the case of the positive externality, the efficient level is actually above the private market equilibrium. Meaning in this case, private markets, free market policy, will not allocate enough of that good relative to what is optimal from society's perspective. So if you leave individuals to their own devices in this situation where there's a positive externality, they will not take enough action. They will not you know, vaccinate themselves enough. They will not wear their masks as frequently as they should. Okay? Folks will not do as much uh, landscaping as they should to be considerate of their neighbors. Right? In equilibrium, Okay, the source of the deadweight loss is too few trades relative to what is efficient. Okay, right? From society's perspective, that's an efficient trade, that's an efficient trade, right? We keep gaining. But the problem is the, the competitive market outcome stops at QPC. Okay, so we miss out on all these extra trades here in the red. Okay, we miss out on those. Those red arrows there are covering that usual deadweight loss triangular region that represents the value of total surplus lost 
from missing out on mutually beneficial good trades, trades that were surplus enhancing from society's perspective here. Okay, well, how can we fix the problem? Well, we could use some sort of command and control policy, like let's force everybody to consume a minimum of Q-Star. For example, everybody needs to have some minimum level of car insurance coverage, or everybody needs to at minimum wear their seatbelt when they get in the car. Okay. These are examples of minimum quantity restrictions that you probably face regularly in your lifetime. So if you're wondering, oh, what's a floor look like on Q-Star? That's what it looks like. Seatbelt laws, for example, are a type of restriction on Q star. Okay. You have to do some minimal effort in order to be legally compliant. So with a negative externality, the market-based approach, uh, or rather, oh, I believe this is a very big typo up here. Let me just fix that and point that out real quick. This should definitely say positive externality in consumption. I think it was right on the last slide, but I forgot to update it here on this particular one. So let me go ahead and just change that very quickly. We should have a positive externality in consumption. That is the situation we were looking at. And the way we're gonna fix this, right, uh, really is related to our carrot and stick discussion, right? Uh, when we have a negative externality, that's bad behavior. We use the stick to punish the bad behavior. We tax the bad behavior. But with a positive externality, the problem isn't bad behavior. The problem's not enough good behavior. And hopefully you remember back to our discussion of competitive market models that one policy out of the four price controls we looked at was capable of encouraging trades that otherwise wouldn't happen. And if you're recalling, oh, that's a subsidy, then hopefully you're realizing, well, that's the carrot in this analogy, right? The stick is the tax, the punishment for bad behavior, but the carrot is the reward for good behavior in the case of a positive externality. So, let me jump to the next slide here and let's talk about implementing a positive, uh, uh, let's talk about implementing a Pagovian subsidy here in the case of a positive externality. Now, again, in order to deter the bad behavior, we taxed in the case of a negative externality. And in this case of a positive externality, we really want to do the opposite. We want to incentivize more trades, more good behavior by subsidizing that behavior at the margin. So uh, something important here, right? Negative externality can be taxed with a negative externality, but with a positive externality, okay, we wanna subsidize the behavior at the margin to restore the efficient outcome. So recall uh, from our previous discussion of taxation that subsidizing a buyer shifts that private marginal benefit curve, it shifts that demand curve up by the size of the subsidy. And we can find the optimal size of the, the corrective tax here. I'm gonna use tax in quotes because really it's a negative tax, right? It is a corrective tax and that a subsidy is a negative tax here. So I wanna be clear about that. When I say the optimal corrective tax, it's not really a typo and that a subsidy is a negative tax. Okay, so we can compute the optimal Pigouvian subsidy by identifying, again, the marginal external benefits that accrue at the efficient level of output. And charging that size subsidy here, right, a negative tax, okay, a subsidy, will result in the after subsidy private marginal benefit curve shifting up by exactly the amount of the subsidy. And what does that do? Well, that means the private individual will agree with society about the volume of trade. When the private individual looks at the after subsidy private marginal benefit curve and does this cost benefit analysis, the private mar uh, individual is gonna settle on Q star uh, as the level that they wanna actually engage in terms of trade or in terms of effort in this market. 
Um, so let's go ahead and wrap up this discussion with a numerical example. We suppose we have a market with private marginal benefit given by 60 minus 3 halves Q. And suppose the individuals generate a positive externality so that marginal benefits, right, external benefits, are equal to 1 half Q. Okay, and for now, let's suppose there is no divergence between costs so that society's marginal cost is equal to the private marginal cost is equal to Q. And what we want to do is find the competitive market equilibrium first by, again, setting the private marginal cost equal to the private marginal benefit. So private marginal cost in this case is Q. Private marginal benefit is over here, 60 minus 3 halves Q. So if we set those things equal to each other, we add the Q to the left. We get 5 halves Q equals 60, which means Q equals 24. So 24 would be the competitive market allocation. Now, to find the efficient allocation, we need to calculate society's marginal benefit. And again, the way we're going to do that is by taking the private marginal benefit and combining it with the marginal external benefit. And when we do that, when we add those things together, we can calculate society's marginal benefit, which comes out to 60 minus Q. Now, if we want to compute the um, efficient outcome that maximizes surplus from society's perspective, all we need to do is set society's marginal benefit equal to society's marginal cost and solve for Q. So let me go ahead and move that bottom bullet point on the right side of the screen up one and give us a little bit more room to work here. And now we can go ahead and compute that efficient allocation and maximize total surplus, right? SMC is just equal to Q. SMB we've calculated above is 60 minus Q. So we set those two things equal to each other and we find that the efficient output or the efficient allocation rather is Q star equals 30 units. So we found the competitive output was 24, Q star was 30. So definitely we're getting that idea that is consistent with what we already discussed regarding positive externalities that the uh, optimal corrective Pigouvian subsidy corresponds to the marginal damages at Q star. And in this case, Q star actually exceeds the competitive free market quantity. So if you leave the market to its own devices here, okay, what happens? Well, we're gonna trade exactly 24 units. And if we trade 24 units, then we are gonna lose out on all of these trades that would have been surplus enhancing from society's perspective otherwise. Okay, so if we wanted to fix the problem, what do we do? Well, we can compute the optimal corrective Pigouvian tax, right, by recognizing that that tax is just equal to the size of the marginal external benefits at the, at the efficient level of output Q star. And that is just uh, one half of Q star was the marginal external benefits function. So when we plug in 30 units for Q star, we find that the optimal Pigouvian subsidy in this case, or the negative tax, if you will, uh, is to subsidize the buyers by $15 per unit, shifting those buyers' uh, private marginal benefits up, right? shifting their willingness to pay up by $15 exactly at every quantity they would possibly purchase. And that, again, will restore output towards the efficient level. So uh, to summarize our results from this segment, we should note we focused on two particular cases. We started with a negative externality in production, and we recognize that in a market with this feature, with a negative externality, a negative side effect, the free market outcome, the competitive market equilibrium, will involve too many bad trades relative to the allocation that is socially efficient. That is, the socially efficient allocation is lower than the market equilibrium. In that instance, the Pigouvian solution involved getting individuals to internalize those external damages so that they would reduce the volume of trade towards that lower efficient level. Now with positive externalities, you really have the opposite problem here in that the competitive market outcome involved too few trades relative to the 
um, uh, socially efficient outcome. And the socially efficient allocation in that regard was greater than the equilibrium allocation that would prevail in the private market. Now, in this instance, uh, we didn't want to tax the good behavior. We wanted to subsidize the good behavior in order to get the individuals to internalize the benefit that they're generating for society. Um, in either case, the Pigouvian approach, I want to be clear, necessitates the role of government intervention in markets that are subject to externalities. Now, we are going to come back and discuss a private market-based solution a little bit later uh, as a possible alternative, but that solution is only going to work in certain situations which don't describe, I think, the majority of situations. So that wraps up our discussion of externalities. Stay tuned in the next segment, um, and I will see you soon. Take care.